think that there has been sort of an un, unwritten story about the importance of you know, protecting our hydro system and protecting our public power and the role that that's played in electing you know, the highest office in the land. It's become sort of less and less in these most recent elections. And that's really something that I, I think that we need to focus on is making sure that our voices are heard and whoever our next president is going to be, they're aware of, of these issues and how important they are to the people of the Northwest. Welcome back to DAM, the official podcast of Northwest Hydropower. I'm your host, Austin Rohr, and I manage all things communications here at Northwest River Partners. Here at the organization, we're not just big fans of hydropower. We love public power, too. In fact, the majority of our members are community-owned, not-for-profit utilities that serve the greater Northwest. Whether it's the equipment we're recording on right now or the device you are streaming this podcast from, there's a good chance that it was powered by energy supplied through a public utility or co-op who received that energy from hydropower. The pairing of dams and public power in the Northwest goes back nearly a century. And today, we've got Ted Case, Executive Director of the Oregon Rural Electric Cooperative Association, or ORECA for short, and a noted author and historian on public power to elaborate on the history that leads us to where we are today. Power Plays explores the relationship between public power and the U.S. presidency. Poles, Wires, and War is a fascinating story about LBJ's efforts to win the hearts and minds of the Vietnamese people. Ted, thanks for making the time today. Awesome. Great to be with you. Thanks for the invite. Appreciate it. And, and speaking of making time, where did you find the time to write all these books? Yeah, yeah. well... Yeah, I do have another job. I'm not a full-time author. There's not that many folks in this country that actually make their living writing full-time, but um, I had a really great piece of advice. I, I went to uh, school. I got a master's degree in writing from Johns Hopkins, and I one of the best pieces of advice that probably I, I took away from that uh, that experience was if you just write 10 minutes a day, you'll be really amazed at the number of pages you could pile up. And so I really sort of adopted that uh, that advice and try to do 10 minutes a day. And sometimes 10 minutes is 10 minutes, but sometimes 10 minutes can turn into a, an hour or two hours, depending on what you have. So I try to do it in the morning. So that's, uh, that's sort of how I did it. Um, and uh, it is remarkable, you know, how many pages you can churn out by just doing something every day. It's kind of like, you know, in a lot of ways, people maybe force themselves to spend a little time reading or, you know, let's say you you make it a point to exercise, you know, first thing in the morning every day. It sounds like for you, you've kind of made that writing. Yeah. And I, I do do it in the morning and you just get up and you you just roll out of bed and get to your computer. And and that's, you know, for me at the end of the day is really hard. You know, after, after a day, you're just your mind is so cluttered up. So that's when I try to do it. And Sometimes, you know, what comes out during those 10 minutes or whatever is really bad, but at least it's something that you can later edit. You know, you got to get it down on the page. So, yeah, for me, that's been pretty successful. But, you know, I still do my fair share of procrastinating. But that's at least how I turned out these two books. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the fact that you have two books, I think it, it speaks for itself. So it, it's definitely working. Uh, I know I mentioned some of the details in the opening, but maybe in your own words, could you tell me a bit about what each of them are about? So uh, power plays. So I, I worked for 12 years at the, the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association after after my time on Capitol Hill. And so I was in government relations there and lobbying Capitol Hill on, you know, hydro issues and, and you know, public power type issues. But there was a, a wonderful library in our on our floor at NRECA, and in, in that's headquartered in Arlington, uh, Virginia. And but also on the on the walls of this library were lots of pictures of presidents at co-op meetings. There was John F. Kennedy at a at a uh, co-op board meeting, and there was uh, Harry Truman, and all these pictures. But there was really no sort of stories or book about the the presidents in the relationship with co-ops. And I thought, you know, I've, I've always sort of had an interest in the presidency as well and in working for the co-ops. And I thought, you know, this would be 
an interesting intersection. And so, so power plays is really about the history of presidents and and electric co-ops and public power and, and hydro, really. And and I start with Franklin Roosevelt and I and I I do a chapter on each president up till George W. Bush. The book came out in 2014. And so, and what I found during that research and I went to presidential libraries and you know and interviewed a lot of people was that there was just this great intersection between public power and in the presidency and and hydropower and how this program began and and it was you know it was also around electoral politics and legislation and, and things like that and it was pretty rich history and and it was untold from my perspective and so th that's what that book was really focused on is, you know, what's the relationship with presidents and, and what did they have to do with building our dams and, and developing rural electrification? And each, you know, each president, you know, up from FDR to Bush really had, you know, sort of a story that I could tell. And so I, you know, I told it the best way I could. And, and I, I just had a, I've had a blast with that book over the years, talking about it and traveling around with it. And, and it's very niche. But there is a market for for a book like that. You know, people want to in this in this business, and so um, so that that's that's what Power Plays is about. And then Poles, Wires, and War really came out of research that I was doing for Power Plays. And Lyndon Johnson, of course, was a great supporter of of public power and and hydropower. And he had started his own co-op down in Texas when the people in his the Texas Hill Country didn't have electricity. And he had just seen what rural electrification and hydropower had done for his his constituents. And and he thought there was nothing that could not be done if you could if you could light up, you know, the countryside for people that didn't have electricity. And so when he was involved, started to get involved in the Vietnam War, there was this again, this intersection between the National Rural Electric Co-op Association and, and Johnson. And they, they cooked up this plan to, to electrify uh, South Vietnam and to win the hearts and minds of the villagers. And just kind of like we had done in the, in the 1930s, 1940s here in America. And of course, it's a little different experience trying to bring rural electrification to a country at war and a guerrilla war for that matter. And so, it uh, it was an interesting story, just really following these three electric co-ops that they try to set up in South Vietnam during the war. And the question was, you know, what happened to them? And so I was really intrigued by that question. In fact, I was so intrigued by it, I went to Vietnam to to try to answer it, and I and I did answer it. Um, and as I tell anybody that wants to know what happened, I say, well, you have to read the book. So. Um, so anyway, that's what that's kind of the quick synopsis of each of those two books. And uh, again, that it's been really a lot of fun, you know, getting those stories out there. And I try to write you know, for the busy reader. And these are not 500 page books that are, you know, they I try to I try to read for people that are, you know, I had a person tell me the other day, hey, I read your whole book on the airplane, you know, a cross country flight. And I said, well, that's perfect. That's that's how I want that book to be dealt with. I, you know, that you can digest it in a, in a one sitting. So that's uh, that's basically kind of the tension span I have. So anyway, that's that's the two books. No, that's fantastic, and and I think uh, it does make a lot of sense to try and to try and keep them condensed and everything. And and they are there's a lot of history there that often doesn't get told, but it, it deserves a space. And I'm glad, uh, I'm glad somebody's made it a priority. So, you know, you also mentioned your, your education, um, with John Hopkins. And, um, I believe, uh, from what I understand, you have a master's of arts in fiction writing, but your books are distinctly nonfiction. How did you utilize that fiction background to help you capture some of these real life stories? Well, what I found Austin was, I have lots of books, and I'm sure you do too, on your nightstand that you pick up and you read, and they just don't hold you. You know, they're they're richly researched, and there's, but you know, you have to be able to have something that gets the page turned. And so what I what I learned from my fiction, and again, I was mainly a short story writer at in 
that's what I've, I've focused on at Johns Hopkins. And I really enjoyed that. I went at night, you know, when I was working back in Washington, D.C. for for NRECA. And, you know, what you learn there is that, you know, something has to happen in these books and you, and you have to you have to make the reader want to know what happens. And so what I tried to do with when I really transitioned into nonfiction with these books about rural electrification and hydropower was, you know, make them a little bit of, of you know, propulsive narrative nonfiction where, you know, you want to know what happens and you just don't give the facts and just the dates. You try to create, you know, a story that, you know, rising action and falling action, you know, just sort of basic storytelling. And so, you you want to write it where people are going to want to know what happens in the next chapter, and so that that's what I took away from my fiction. And I and I think people have said that to me is like you know I really want to know what happens. I had to turn the page. And again, these are not thrillers. These are not you know the kind of the kind of stuff that you know gets made into movies. But you know it's enough that keeps people wanting more. And that's uh, and, and that's what I took away from my fiction. And that's what I tried to write, because that's what I want to read. I think that's what one people want to read is, is, you know, something that they can say, gosh, I, I don't want to put that down. And I'm not sure that I've reached that level of, of um, thriller yet, but I've, I've tried to make it interesting enough that you got to keep going. That certainly makes a lot of sense to me. And, and another point you made that I, I really uh, resonated with is the embarrassing stack of books that's currently on my nightstand that I'm trying to work through. But, um, you know, there is uh, an interesting, an interesting thing that seems to have picked up. Uh, you know, I don't want to catch myself in, in a bad spot by saying more recently, but I've at least personally taken note more recently of the number of books that either combine sort of a, you know, they blend fiction and nonfiction, or they use sort of fiction elements to move the nonfiction stories along in a, in a way that keeps them engaging and, and doesn't make them just, you know, purely a, you know, a history textbook sort of thing. Um, it seems like a, a really wise way of approaching something like that. Well, I think the average American right now <clears throat> is reading, you know, somewhere between about four and 10 books a year. And again, I probably listen to more audiobooks now than I read. And I think it's just, it's the the sign of the times and people's attention span. And, you know, you've, you've got to give them something that keeps them going because everybody's so busy and there's just other things that they can do. And so if you can't hold them, you know, then you're just going to put that book down. And I'm like you, I've got this big stack that I'm just never going to get through. And so if I can find something that's going to hold me, and I can learn something from it too. I, I probably read less fiction now than I, than I used to. Um, but if you can find somebody that can make nonfiction interesting, that, that's what that's what I'll pick up. So you write every day. Do you have any future plans for books that you can share at least right now? I'm, I'm sure you don't want to give away too much. Yeah, I I have a couple pro you know, and I've got a lot of stuff that I've started that just. It doesn't quite hold me, you know, because if you're going to devote in, in these books, Power Plays took me basically four years to write. And so if you're going to devote that amount of time to something, it's got to be really something that you're will hold you. And so I've started some things that it just doesn't quite hold me. One thing that I'm I'm interested in now, and I'm just starting to do a little bit of research and we'll see where it goes. But this whole notion of um, sabotage and sort of terrorism against the electric utility industry, which we have seen. Um, you know, recently and, and even not so recently. Um, to me, that's that's sort of a, a story that hasn't been told really well. We, you know, we've seen it happen in, in the Northwest and, you know, in this last year, one of my co-ops was in 2016, you know, had a substation shot up and, and it was, you know, essentially eco-terrorism. And, you know, there's a lot of legislatures right now, including, you know, ours in Oregon, looking at increasing penalties for, you know, those that tried to bring down the electrical grid. And, um, you know, there, there was even, you know, something that I've started chasing down that when they, when they uh, raided bin Laden's compound and, and killed him back in, I think it was 2011, you know, in their, in the stuff, the hard drives that they found was, you know, quite a, a trove of plans to blow up federal dams in the 
uh, in the United States, you know, so even, you know, even Al Qaeda was sort of looking at our, um, our energy electrical grid and, you know, energy re resources and facilities. So anyway, I'm doing some stuff on that. We'll see where it goes, who knows, but um, hopefully you'll see something for me and, you know, from me in the next couple of years. No, that sounds like a fantastic topic. And given what has happened recently in, in the, the events you brought up, it makes a lot of sense to cover it. It's also, it is an interesting thing to think about. I mean, so many of our dams have some sort of public availability to them, right? I mean, um, I was very surprised last year, just as sort of a backstory. I went out with some friends and, and did some of the shad fishing that goes on uh, each sort of June in the uh, area below Bonneville Dam. And um, I'd never been out there to do this before, but the guys I was with said, oh yeah, you know, follow us, uh, come over to the Oregon side and, you know, we'll go over to the spot that I like. And I did not realize that that involved uh, going in uh, through the the gates at Bonneville where, you know, they do have a security check and everything, but um, once they check over your vehicle, they wave you on through and then you drive across the dam itself <laughs> in order to get to the area. So that was kind of an eye-opening experience for me of like, wow, I, you know, I've been to some other dams where, you know, access was a little more challenging, but uh, certainly across the board, you know, they're, they're pretty, pretty open, you know, they're, they're not the most high security thing in the world as compared to, I think, some of the other infrastructure that a lot of people focus their time and attention on as far as, you know, vulnerabilities with security. Yeah, I, that's exactly right. And, you know, I, I drive by a, a substation on my way to the office every day and, you know, it's sort of right in the middle of a neighborhood and, and, you know, you put a fence around it, but, you know, there's, there's some vulnerabilities there, you know, and, and our, of course, our electrical grid is pretty fragile, but it is so important. And so I think, uh, I think this is going to be an issue that we're going to have to deal with, you know, going forward. And so, you know, perhaps I'll, I'll do something more with that, but it, it's, uh, it's a, it's a fascinating circumstance and fascinating stuff that's happening out there right now. It is. And uh, I, I don't think I need to put this disclaimer out to anybody that's going to listen to this podcast. But regardless, uh, please don't do anything that jeopardizes the security of our energy infrastructure, because it is really nice that we don't have to worry about it. And it's also really nice that people can have some access to this stuff and, and get to go see it firsthand. I think it's really a net positive for the public. So yeah, let's keep it that way. <laughs> but uh, so uh, as far as topics that you have covered with your book so far, are there are there any others that uh, that have sparked some interest, maybe some kind of side stories that you discovered while doing the research on uh, on some of the topics you've been covering? Well, I mean, I think one of the things that I found in in my research is just sort of the intersection of electoral politics in when it comes to the hydropower, you know, and, and how those issues have really informed presidential elections. And, you know, I, I write about in, you know, in power plays, there was a story of John Kennedy, who was, again, you know, from Massachusetts, a place that did not have really any public power or, you know, big hydro facilities. And, you know, what, what he tried to do, because he wanted to learn more about rural America in the West is he really immersed himself in it and became a really huge supporter of uh, river development, hydropower and electric co-ops. Again, there was no, there's no electric co-op there in Massachusetts, but you know, he, he knew that he needed to, to do better amongst, you know, farmers and rural areas. And so he, he really became a huge supporter of, you know, developing our rivers and, and, um, but he would, you know, he would still lose, he still lost really big in rural areas in 1960. And it really drove him crazy. I mean, he was very, you know, he was very disappointed with all the, all the efforts that he put in. And, you know, there, and there's one quote, you know, in my book where, where one of the public power officials thanked him for all his efforts on behalf of, um, you know, co-ops and munis for all of his, his efforts to develop new hydropower resources. And he says, you know, a lot of good it did me in the West. In fact, he said, you know, because I can't, you know, I don't think I'm going to win Oregon and Washington. 
He says, I got to go down to Texas and campaign to see if I can win Texas. And he said this, of course, in 1963. And, and then he went to Texas. And we all know what happened down there in, you know, in November of 1963. He was assassinated. And so th there was just sort of a history of, you know, Harry Truman in, you know, 1945 was all but written off as, you know, a guy that was going to lose to Thomas Dewey in that presidential election. You know, he was down by like 12 points. And, you know, so he went on that very famous whistle stop tour across the United States. And when you look at those speeches, and again, he came to the Northwest, he came to Oregon, you look at the speeches and see what he was talking about as he went, you know, through the, the countryside and gave these, you know, speeches from the back of this train. He talked about hydropower and he talked about rural electrification and natural resources development. And he talked about it wherever he went. And, you know, he covered, you know, tens of thousands of miles on that. And so, so, you know, I looked at those speeches and talked to people that saw him. And of course, you know, he won that election and, you know, the biggest upset in, in the history of the presidential elections. And so, um, and he really attributed a lot of that success to the, the farm boat and what he did in rural areas. And so I think that there has been sort of an, un, you know, an unwritten story about the importance of, you know, the things that we work on, what Northwest River Partners work on, and I work on, you know, protecting our hydro system and, and, you know, protecting our public power and the role that that's played in electing, you know, the highest office in the land. And so I, I try to tell some of those stories. And, you know, again, it's, it's become sort of less and less in these, in these, most recent elections. And that's really something that I, I think that we need to focus on is making sure that, you know, our voices are heard and whoever our next president is going to be, um, you know, that they are, they're aware of, of these issues and how important they are to the people of, of the Northwest. I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, I mean, granted, we are a bit biased here, but um, it, it's almost, it's been odd to, you know, in the greater context of of the country's history to see that, you know, now, if anything, you have some people that might be campaigning on being anti-hydro, um, which, you know, is almost, it's relatively new, it seems like, you know, you don't have a lot of, a lot of that popping up uh, with prior, prior elected officials and, and their campaigns and everything. You, you speak to a lot about, or you've spoken a lot about what has sort of led you to to study up on this story but one thing that you said there that that i'd like to to touch on a bit more you described it as sort of the the unwritten story i mean is that really do you think what what ultimately led you to to go down this path is that the history is maybe out there but it hasn't been captured or, or covered very much yeah, that was the, the intriguing part of me. And of course, the research is, you know, is so interesting. Um, you know, one one of the things that Richard Nixon was this huge um, opponent of public power and particularly electric co-ops, you know, and one of the things that one of the things that I found and, you know, when you find something like this here, it's it's like a real gem as I was in that the presidential library there. And I found a I found a recording that I don't think had ever been really released, where he basically said, um, electric co-ops are the most vicious group you'll ever find. And, you know, of course, this is, you know, I mean, electric co-ops are not really known for being vicious. It's certainly the people that I represent here in Oregon. But, you know, you have a president of the United States that's based, you know, really on the attack against, uh, you know, people that are trying to electrify and, and bring electricity to, to rural areas. And and so, you know, finding a little finding a little gem like that and being able to illuminate that and tell that story, um, you know, that that's that's pretty gratifying. And so again, I, I, I thought that some of these some of these stories deserve to be told and you know and hadn't been told. And so that's you know that's why I did those research. And and I would just commend anybody um, that's interested, go to a presidential library. I mean, no matter what you're interested in that president, there's just so much there and they, the people are so accommodating and interested. And, and um, you know, anybody that I talk to that visits the presidential library, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, 
it's a it's a pretty it's a pretty fun experience and interesting experience. You will not regret it. And so that that's where I got a lot of this information. And you know, it's just a treasure trove. Yeah, that was one thing I I was sort of thinking about um, earlier on is is where you find a lot of this information. But it sounds like the presidential libraries are are probably a goldmine for it. Um, you know, and then obviously uh, say like the first hand accounts that you've brought up maybe are a good way to, to supplement that. But um, yeah, presidential libraries, do you have any others that you, you would recommend if people wanted to do their own research? Um, yeah, I mean, I, the, the Truman Library is is fascinating, you know, yeah, Nixon. So I, I, yeah, I just think any anyone that you go to, you know, some of these places are not easy to get to, you know, the John F. Kennedy one is in, it was back in, in Boston, but uh, they just have, you know, they have documents. I, I found this, you know, I found this letter, just a quick story here. I found this letter that NRECA had written to, to uh, LBJ, you know, back in 1965, basically proposing that they set up these co-ops in, in Vietnam and saying, basically, we, we could help you win the war. I mean, it was very, that, that blatant and, and that audacious. And so it was a copy of this letter. And then I found the original letter was online at an auction house in in New York City, and this was a, a and this is a letter that had a handwritten notes on it from LBJ. And so I asked my wife. I said, "Gosh, you know, it would be really cool to bid on this letter and see if we could I could get the original of this letter that you know the President of the United States is himself written notes on." And um, and my wife said, "You know, that would be very cool, but you know, it would also be cool that our kids get to go to college." So uh, I did not, I did not get a chance to get the original of that letter, but you know that that's the kind of stuff you can find at these presidential libraries. Speaking of of presidents and, and history, maybe you could take me back to where all of this starts. You know why why are these first dams constructed, and and how does public power, how do cooperatives and public utilities and and things like that, and and really the rural electrification movement. How does that all get sort of crafted up in in the minds of of the people in charge? Yeah, I mean, you can go way far back and really go back to you know Theodore Roosevelt, who was very interested in developing um, rivers and hydropower and you know creating sort of a public use for our our waterways. Uh, but I give a lot of credit to Franklin Roosevelt. I, I think you know it in the end, it was really his vision. You know, he came to Portland in, in 1932 and gave a very famous speech in downtown Portland talking about how they're going to break up all these big trusts that were r- running the, uh, the, you know, the electric power industry and that we were going to use our, our rivers like the Columbia River for multiple use purposes and that we were going to develop hydropower. And he just had this vision. And, you know, and it really came from personal experiences for him. He, of course, suffered from polio, and so he would go down to Georgia, and he would he would go to these warm springs down there, and it really sort of soothed his you know his polio, and you know the, the people that he saw down there in this these communities down in Warm Spring, they didn't have electricity. You know, they were living basically you know a life that was tantamount to the Middle Ages. And so he, he saw that we were going to have to do something about rural electrification. And he saw sort of this, again, this connection with hydropower and um, rural electrification that, you know, if you bring those things together, you can bring people, you know, out of the darkness. And so he really started this movement. And of course, he was elected president in 1932 and then, you know, immediately started, you know, development of of Bonneville Dam and the Grand Coulee Dam, and then you know just began this this rural electrification program, and you know he needed a partner to to try to do it in these areas. And of course, the, the investor-owned utilities weren't really not that interested in it. There was no money to be made in these very uh, sparsely uh, populated areas, and so these electric co-ops really took it amongst themselves to to try to do it. There was a lot of a concern that they didn't have the business acumen or the, you know the technical acumen to 
to get the lights on, to get the bills paid and do all the things that you needed to do to run electric utility, but nobody else wanted to do it. And so began this partnership with electric co-ops and that's what really started in, in, the, in the 1930s with the, the development of rural electrification, with starting these the, the hydropower program on the you know the Columbia River, and it just really all sort of came together in the 1930s and 1940s. And there's just a, a, a quick story I had in the book about you know it was really starting to get going in the 1930s, and these co-ops were starting across the country, you know, including out here in the Northwest, and they were building hydropower, and FDR, he wanted some credit. I mean, he he saw, you know, the New Deal, what what this had done, and but he'd never dedicated an electric co-op. He'd never been to one, so he went down to one in Georgia, and, you know, if you've ever been to a co-op annual meeting, they're you know they're they're nice festive events, but you know people come for the meal and and you know to win some prizes and and um, well, of course, the president showed up to this dedication of this co-op. It was like they're going to light up like 350 families, 40,000 people showed up. And so it was this giant affair. And the president was so excited about it. He gave this big speech and he decided that he wanted to be the one to flip the switch to electrify this, you know, the small town, the small co-op. And th there's a story of the Secret Service basically, you know, whispering into his ear while he's on stage. You know, Mr. President, you're not going anywhere near this switch. We're not going to see you electrocuted in front of 40,000 people. Of course, again, you know, this is the early days of rural electrification and not everything was as, you know, had the standards we have now. And so he did not get to flip the switch, but he's the one, Austin, that I really believed is, you know, he gets a lot of credit for what he, what he did. And I think he deserves that credit because, you know, he did a lot out here in the Northwest and, you know, he dedicated the Bonneville Dam out here in 1937. And so, all, the, all these projects that we have here today, this amazing system, really can be traced back to his vision um, in the 1930s. And there is, there's sort of a, a simultaneous story there as well, at least from the little bit of, of uh, you know, history that I can remember being taught in grade school about utilizing all of this to, to also help pull people out of the depression, correct? Absolutely. I mean, it was it was really a life of, of drudgery, particularly for the women. You know, they they did so much. Just they had to go down to the river and get water. They every day was wash day. It, it was really just an incredibly it was a life of drudgery. And and you see these women that were just stooped over and that, you know, they looked they looked old you know, when they were in their 19, or when they were in their, their 30s, 20s and 30s, they looked like they were old women just because it, life was so hard. And so it really did bring people out of poverty and electricity can do that. It, it can make life a lot easier. And so that that's what this was really all about. And, you know, Roosevelt saw that and Truman saw that. Um, Lyndon Johnson saw that when he set up, you know, his own co-op is that, you know, again, electricity can really, it can change society. And, and so that, that's what they did. I think as well, it's, it's hard for people sometimes to grasp that concept and, and remember that less than a hundred years ago, you know, society looked like that, maybe not universally, but for many, many people, especially in rural areas, life was vastly different from from how we have it today and another example that uh, is, it gets a bit off topic but i i promise it it is relevant is i remember during the very early stages of covid when you know we were all kind of glued to the tv and, and glued to press conferences and, and trying to figure out what's going on and and when's this thing going to be over they started talking about the potential for this to span months or or possibly years and that was sort of a, a really hard thing to wrap your head around like gosh are we really going to be doing this for you know the next possible you know two years of our, our our lives but then you you would look back as as examples started being brought up at the timelines of of you know other diseases like you know the plague or spanish flu or whatever and you realize that those also lasted, 
years and and they were significant portions of of people's lifetimes living with those illnesses being spread and, and the consequences of that and in the same way when you look at the history of constructing our hydropower system and electrifying rural areas and, and bringing electrification to the entire country it didn't happen overnight and it wasn't necessarily maybe as easy or straightforward as as we like to think when we look at it on history and you know we just sort of see you know Bonneville Dam uh first uh construct or you know built in 1932 or you know construction begins in 1932 um so you know we have it very good now with with our electrical system with hydropower but could you maybe describe if you if you discovered in your research uh, any of the challenges early on with making all of this electrification happen? Yeah, and it did. Yeah, it did not happen overnight. I mean, a lot you know a lot happened in the 1930s and 1940s. But you know, you're still you know I think by 1945 we probably half the farms were electrified. You know, maybe slightly more, 60 percent. I can't remember the precise statistics, but yes, I mean just the whole notion of trying to bring poles and and wire over, you know, large stretches of the landscape in some of these very difficult to serve areas. When you think about, you know, rural America, you just think about, you know, my state of Oregon, how how sparse some of that is and and mountainous. And it did. It was, and a a lot of these folks were um, people, you know, farmers, you know, helping out. And again, there was not this giant workforce, you know, to come in there. And so it did, it, it took years and years and years. And, and it, it, it took a huge federal investment. I mean, that's the other thing that sort of, you know, I think is overlooked a little bit was, you know, without the Rural Electrification Administration and these, you know, very um, low interest loans and this partnership, it's this, I, I call it the, the greatest private public partnership we've ever really seen coming together to to try to to deal with a huge a huge issue, which is the lack of electricity in this country. But until really about 1960, you know, they were not up until the, you know, the 80 percent of, of farms electrified in this country. You think about that. And so, yeah, it, it was it spanned decades and it was you know, really one of the most difficult things that you could do. And we see the same thing now, and there's a lot of parallels about this. And I occasionally, you know, I got a call not long ago from National Public Radio asking me about sort of this this connection between, you know, what they did in the 1930s with rural electrification and what we're trying to do with broadband today. And there's, there's a, certainly a lot of parallels. I mean, it's a giant investment. And again, you know, broadband is is the same kind of thing you know, everybody needs broadband, no matter where you are, just like, you know, you need electricity. So I think there's a lot of parallels. And we just see how difficult it is to make sure that every kid has, you know, broadband in, in every community in this country. And of course, to your point, Austin, about the pandemics, that we certainly learned that um, during during the pandemic about the importance of that. So the, these big, these big projects, these these big initiatives, they can be done, but they're very hard to do and they're very expensive. And I think you're right. There there really isn't other examples that I can think of that are as monumental in terms of the federal investment, the the partnership between the public and private entities and, and federal government and just everybody kind of being on the same board working towards the same goal and and getting it done in a in a way that's been really effective and you know we're still benefiting from that today as we you know are are uh, it feels like rapidly approaching the hundred year mark of of some of these dams being built. Yeah, I mean it's it would be very difficult to build the Bonneville Dam today or Grand Coulee today. I mean these are they, they happened at a time where you could get those type of giant public works projects done. And it's, it's very difficult in, you know, in these circumstances to do it, but we have these projects and they're, and, you know, they've lasted this long and they've, they've served us very well, but there was, there was a moment in time where you could do it. And that moment is probably past. Well, and that's something too, 
you know, not to, to get too political about it, but, you know, if we're just being really objective, I think that that's something that doesn't get talked about very often when, when there's conversations about potentially, uh, you know, removing and replacing some of that hydropower infrastructure. You know, what we have now was built in a, in a really opportune window with everybody on board. And, um, you know, not only is it hard to envision everyone being on the same page about the removal of that infrastructure, but it's also very hard to see everyone getting on the same page about what to replace it with and actually getting those things across the finish line. That's exactly right. And, you know, I've been, you know, at this job at ORECA for 14 years. And when I came, when I came out here in, you know, the Oregon legislature, you know, everything was focused around developing wind resources and, you know, developing tax credits and incentives for wind. And then that's, you know, that sort of transitioned a few years later into incentives for solar. And, you know, through all of this, and I'm not saying it's, you know, these are all the shiny penny, but they're, you know, but through all of this, you know, they had this incredible resource sort of right under their nose, which is our hydro resources. And it, it, it just sort of gets left behind and not talked about and, and frankly taken for granted. Because, you know, there's always the focus on the new thing, the new technology. And of course, you know, that's great. And we need to develop those and, and we are. But, you know, we've had these great resources and they've served us well and they continue to serve us well. But, they, you know, they just don't get the respect they deserve because they're, they're old. You know, they are, you know, some of these projects were, you know, built in the 30s and some of these projects were built in the 40s and 50s. Um, and, you know, people want to focus on, you know, something new. But, you know, they are amazing resources, and I wish they just got more respect. And I think, you know, one of the things that you guys do so well in North Coast River Partners is trying to highlight, you know, th these are really incredible resources, and we cannot overlook them. And I, I think you guys have done a, a spectacular job of raising the profile about the hydro system, benefits of the hydro system, and we just need to continue to do it. Well, that feedback is much appreciated because we do, we do spend a lot of time really trying to emphasize that point, and 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 also too, I think it, you know, we try and remind people that the the concrete structure might be old, and you know there might be a lot of history attached to these facilities, but in terms of the technology that's being used, and you know, as as we replace worn out parts and and make upgrades and things, you know, they are sort of constantly having new life breathes into them and, and they continue to, to serve us well. And that's one thing that's sort of unique. You know, I, I recently read a book on, um, actually it was on fire lookouts and, and someone, you know, who spent, uh, I think like 10 years now doing a seasonal fire lookout job, um, and their experience there, but they also given the amount of time that they have on their hands have spent a lot of time researching wildfire management and and dedicate a lot of time in the book to going over the history of not only wildfire management but also how the federal government has managed the environment and and how those views have changed drastically over time in terms of you know what value is placed on the land and what value is is placed on you know preserving forest versus allowing it to burn and et cetera. And I won't get too deep into that history, uh, given the relevancy to this podcast, but there is a, an interesting parallel to be drawn there because when it comes to hydropower, despite the fact that so much change has taken place over the last, you know, 80, 90 years since the dams were constructed, they continue to remain relevant and and they continue to also be a solution to our problems even as our, our problems have changed hydropower seems to remain critical to finding a, a, a way to move through them and, and solve them uh, coming from the the electrical cooperative side of things how do you see this combination of public power and, and hydropower still being important in the modern day well, of course, everything, and you guys talk about it on these podcasts, you know, about the movement towards clean energy in the Northwest, and we, we've tried that and here in Oregon, have done it, and certainly in Washington State, they've done it. You know, and what I try to do in my little piece of the 
of the world here in, in the Oregon legislature and with our, you know, with our governor is just try to make sure that we are in alignment on our on our goals. And if you want, you know, 100 percent clean energy and by a date certain, you know, we have we have a, a resource that's going to help you get there. And it's not going to get you all the way there. I thought you had a really good uh, podcast or guest the other day with um, Energy GPS talking about, you know, the, the challenges of getting to 100 percent. But, you know, when you are advocating for removal of, you know, the lower Snake River dams, you know, it's very challenging to get there. And so I, I've spent, you know, quite a bit of time here in Oregon trying to convince, you know, our leaders that, you know, we have to be in alignment. I think that we can work together on these issues and, and let's get out of the courtroom and let's not let's not continue to fight each other over these things. And let's 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 appreciate this resource that can help you meet your goals. And, you know, so far that has not that argument has not been compelling and certainly wasn't with Governor Kate Brown. Um, but we have a new governor here and, and you know, Tina Kotek and and she's admittedly is, you know, trying to get up to speed on some of these issues. She's focused on a lot of other issues with homelessness and and that's that's been her focus. But certainly I think these are these are some of the things that we got to continue to remind people of is that it this is going to help us meet our goals. And it's it's gotten us to where we are today and it can help us in the future. But you know when we are when we're out of alignment, you know, pushing for 100% clean, but yet ask, you know, asking to take out, you know, the lower Snake River dams, you, you just, you're going to have a hard time getting there. And so that that's, that's something that I think we're, you know, we're, we're working on together with ORCA and Northwest River Partners and, you know, and others is trying to educate folks about the value of the system. One other thing that I wanted to spend some time talking about was that, you know, not, we often talk about sort of the the opportune window of, of building out the hydropower system and, and really, you know, the, I guess, pivot point for rural electrification and, and public power being during that FDR era, during that New Deal era, and, you know, dams like Bonneville and Grand Coulee get a lot of recognition. But as you know, and, and hopefully our listeners know, there are quite a few dams in our hydro system, whether you're talking about those other lower Columbia or, or lower snake dams, there's some of the mid Columbia projects, which we've talked about a little bit in previous episodes of the podcast that are in the, in the hands of some of our public utilities here in the Northwest. And then, you know, there's dams further up river in, in sort of the upper regions or, or even out into some of the tributaries of, of the Colombian snake. What was the reason you know, we know the initial reason for, for building the hydropower system, and, and there's a lot of history that's been touched on there. But when it comes to expanding the system and, and adding more dams over time, what was some of the reasoning behind that, that, that maybe some of these other, you know, presidents, for example, that you've mentioned earlier in the podcast, uh, jumped on board with? Well, I, I think, you know, once those big projects came in Bonneville and, and Grand Coulee, you know, they realized the, the incredible resource and, the, and the, the incredible amount of generation that you could get. And then of course, then we had the war and then this, and then the, the advent of the aluminum smelters out here in the Northwest. And, and again, I think it was, it was maybe Truman that said, you know, we, I, we could not have won the war without these, we, these dams, but it just built up this whole sort of, culture of, you know, hydro development. And again, there's, you know, Bonneville markets from, you know, 31 separate projects, I believe the number is. And that really came, you know, I think, I think the economic expansion in the Northwest and the war effort and, and all of that really developed this, this incredible, you know, series of dams up and down, you know, the Columbia and Snake Rivers. And, you know, some of these are, again, some of these were built in the 30s, some of these were built, you know, in like the 1960s, you know, but over time, it just became, you know, the recognition of how much clean generation that you could, and affordable, you know, how much affordable clean generation you could, you could get from these, from these projects. And it's really a remarkable system and you know, how it works and, you know, and how it got done. But uh, it really all of this sort of intersection with 
economic development. And then, you know, in World War II, it's just hard to overstate, you know, the amount of, of planes and, you know, equipment that they churned out, you know. And again, you know, a lot of the work on um, the Manhattan Project, you know, took place, you know, up here as well. And so th these dams have a pretty rich history of, of being involved in, you know, th these kind of in incredible pivot points in our nation's history, including World War II. And that system really is, you know, it, we're, I think it's safe to say we're both big fans of it and, and we're both big fans of hydropower. So a question that I have to ask on, on behalf of, you know, our listeners and, and people who don't follow this stuff extremely closely, is there a reason that we haven't built or, you know, don't have any plans in the future to, to build more hydropower in our rivers? Well, I think there will be. I, I don't know that you're going to have a, you know, a very a giant federal project. It's just, I, I think, again, sign of the times, uh, very difficult to to get these things through environmental reviews. And and so I, I, I think there will be more hydro built. I don't know exactly where it will be, but I think, you know, the federal system is probably the federal system. And again, I think you're right. There's these these projects are continuing to be enhanced. Our fish passage is, is we have a great record on that. There's incredible investments going in on that. But, you know, I think I think the days of these, you know, the giant, you're not gonna build a Grand Coulee now, but, you know, you can certainly, I think there's other projects and private hydro that's going in. But um, again, there, there was this moment and it, it was it, it, people that had a lot of vision, but, you know, now now is probably maintaining the existing fleet that you have. The trend, I guess, has, has sort of shifted uh, in that case, um, and, and and maybe not necessarily for for better or worse, but the needs have shifted as has the the opportunity. As far as the the history that we've gone over today, and and your research on it. What are some of the trends that you're observing in the public power space as it relates to, to national politics uh, currently? We talked a little bit about it earlier. It's I, I just think you know some of the trends are uh, new technologies, new investments, and always looking for the next thing. Always looking for the you know the new technology, something that hasn't been tried before. And you know you're you're seeing this with hydrogen and you know different technologies and SMRs and there's some exciting things out there and so I, I think you know you're going to see those kind of trends but I think what we need to do is is continue to you know the work you're doing and we're trying to do is is really educate people about these these projects I one of the things that we try to do here in Oregon with legislators is to take them up to Bonneville Dam. And these are, you know, state senators and, and state reps. And, you know, what we find, Austin, and it's remarkable, is, you know, even people that represent the Portland area, they have never set foot at Bonneville Dam. They'll drive by it, but they've never been there. They don't know a lot about it. And these are people that could become the governor of this state or a U.S. senator. And, you know, so we try to do that, is try to just educate them about, hey, this this is what happens here. And this is the investment that goes in. This is the investment that goes for fish. And, you know, people drive by these up, up and down the, you know, the Columbia River and they see them, um, but they don't know a lot about them. You know, maybe they stop in and see the fish hatchery, but they they never go visit that project. And so, you know, and once they do, we, we just find that they're they're very impressed with what they see. But we need to do a lot more of that work because there's just there's a, just a, not a lot of education about um, the value of these and you know and what we're doing I think on things like fish passage and and um, you know enhancing that that system and the in the clean energy they provide so we got a lot of work to do on our end. I can personally attest to it as well um, that doing a dam tour and also at the same time doing a, a fish hatchery tour really was an eye-opening experience. I mean, that for me was a catalyst in sort of, you know, getting me interested in it because suddenly it was like, okay, you know, yeah, I've seen pictures of it, but really getting to see how it all works and, and understanding the scale and, and magnitude of these projects, it, it is, it, it's something that 
you know, not everyone's going to get to experience, but the more people that can experience it, the better. And, and this is, you know, kind of shifting towards some of your work as the executive director of an organization representing public power. What other sorts of responsibilities do you take on in that role? It's primary legislative and regulatory work. You know, so we, our, our state legislature is meeting right now. So we're down, we're down in the Capitol and, you know, following legislation and trying to protect the 18 electric co-ops we have in the state. We also, you know, do work on the federal level. In fact, I was just back in, in Washington, D.C., you know, recently and, and ran around the same time that uh, River Partners was doing their tour. And I saw Kurt, you know, on Capitol Hill. And sometimes we were, I followed him in an appointment or he followed us in an appointment. And so I think great synergies between our two organizations. But so, yeah, we spend a lot of time on legislation. We uh, we do some training for our directors and, uh, you know, try to uh, there's a we do a youth tour for, you know, kids to to learn about uh, electric co-ops and just try to provide whatever whatever value added we can for for the 18 electric co-ops in this state. We represent about 500,000 Oregonians. And we have good relationships with other public power, the municipal utilities and the people's utility districts. And so that's our main function here. I think we can certainly relate in terms of, you know, just representing public power. It's a, it's a, a big workload and it's very fun and there's a lot to cover and it comes with, you know, unique challenges. Uh, sometimes just, you know, in the amount of time you have to, to dedicate to it. But one really cool thing that I learned about recently, actually, you know, before you and I spoke about it in, in preparation for the podcast today, was this trip that was put together to go down to Guatemala and help with electrification there. And I, I first, you know, heard this presentation from Mike at Pioneer Utility Resources, who's a, a common friend of, of both of ours and got to see some really amazing photos. And then, you know, you mentioned it as well. So tell me a bit about ORACA's efforts in, in heading down there and, you know, really helping out this community in Guatemala. So, yeah, it really came to sort of this notion of, of paying it forward, using the skills that, you know, we, we learned and, and to electrify the, you know, the rural areas of, of our state and I had heard that the other states had done this, other 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 statewide organizations, Oklahoma and, and Colorado and and others. And so I I brought out folks to talk to my board about us taking on a project of our own, where we would work with the NRECA. They have an international program there, and primarily work in Guatemala. And and the, the pitch to the board was, you know, we have to raise about a hundred thousand dollars, and we'd have to provide you know, about a dozen linemen, this would be all Oregon project, and we would go down and we would electrify the village. And uh, my board decided to go along with it, um, you know, as global citizens and seeing the value of, of, again, paying it forward. And so we did that in March. And we were supposed to go right before the, the pandemic hit in 2020, the project got delayed three years. But we did it. And I, I think it's one of the best things that our statewide organization has ever done. Uh, and we had about um, 10 linemen go down there. I had a chance to go down at the tail end of the project. Um, I brought my daughter with me who speaks Spanish. I don't speak any Spanish. And, you know, we, we electrified about 40 homes in this village of Ventura, which is about four hours from Guatemala City. And, you know, these people um, are live, living a life just like, you know, people in Rural America lived in the 1930s. No electricity, again, a life of, of hardship, of drudgery. Um, and we brought them electricity. And it was very gratifying to see they were incredibly gracious people. They make about $7 a day picking coffee in the fields. Um, their homes are have dirt floors. And they're you know not the kind of homes that most of us have. And, uh, you know, frankly, these people have nothing, but they are incredibly gracious. And, um, and now they have a chance at a better life. And so that's, uh, again, something that I, I think was just incredibly inspirational from our end. I think our linemen got as much out of it as, and I certainly did, and my daughter did, as the people of, of that village. 
And uh, and to think about Austin when you still have close to a billion people in this in this world that don't have electricity. I mean, we just did our little small part of it, and hopefully we'll go back and do more. But it's it, there's a lot of work to be done. But you know, everybody can do their little piece of it, and uh, I'm certainly glad that we did. Well, you know, the other thing too is whether it's it's something that you mentioned today or you know also the conversation that I had on a previous episode of the podcast with Rick Dunn access to electricity really does have a a direct correlation with people's quality of life and you know their ability to be able to have a a I wouldn't say comfortable but you know have a have a positive <laughs> experience in life, um, you know, to be able to get more out of it. And so there's, there is a, a tremendous value to, you know, trying to bring that benefit to them. You yeah, know, I, I, I absolutely agree. And, you know, just one example down there that the pe- these people in this village use, use wood to cook inside their homes. And, you, you know, you go into their homes and again, they're very, very gracious people invite you into their homes. But it just smells like smoke. I mean, everything is in smoke. The kids are inhaling smoke all day long. And, you know, this is not healthy. There's no doubt about it. And so giving them a chance to, you know, cook without wood inside the home. And and we donated hot plates to them as well. And they're going to learn how to use electricity. But, you know, just to see the look on their face at the light bulbs that were sort of hanging down that we, our, our team installed. And so they don't have to use candles or, you know, and it's, um, it is going to be life changing. And it, yeah, it, it will change their life in ways that they cannot even imagine, just like it did here in America. Exactly. And, and how did you, how did you land on this particular village in Guatemala? So working with NRECA, they identified the village for us. And again, it's, we call it sort of this forgotten valley. Um, it was up against air, areas that, had electricity, but it was pretty clear to us talking to the municipality that they were never going to get it. It just didn't make any sense for you know th- those folks down there. They were doc- not going to extend the lines. It was just too expensive, and so th- you know these folks would have never had electricity unless we provided it for them. I, I mean, I, I'm pretty confident of that. And so there's plenty other areas that again we did about 40 homes, and it, it was not easy to do, and there was no None of the big, you know, bucket trucks or any of that kind of equipment. Our guys were digging out, you know, post holes with their hands. And it, it was very hard work and they worked, you know, long hours and hardly took any time off. It was about a three week project. And so, uh, but, it, you know, our partners at NREC International were really helpful in, in helping us navigate through that because, you know, it's very challenging to to be able to go into a foreign country and and provide electricity and the and the power source by the way um, is is hydropower which is just amazing and wonderful so just a great connection it does sound like there's a lot of parallels to you know electrification here in terms of utilizing hydropower and and finding ways to to bring energy to areas that that otherwise just simply wouldn't receive it. The other thing that comes to mind is, you know, some of the the stories you shared about the the book you wrote on Vietnam and and our efforts to bring electrification to rural areas there. And I uh, I haven't forgotten your uh, comment that you know for people to learn about that history that they need to uh, they need to go read the book, but. Um, is there anything that you can draw in terms of comparisons between um, or, or, you know, lessons maybe you learned from your, your research on Vietnam that you were able to bring to the table when you you went to, to Guatemala? Yeah. And I think, you know, people are really the same all over in many respects. And again, it's the whole notion. And, you know, in these electric co-ops, again, in you know, Vietnam, it was it was as challenging as circumstances you shall ever have, you know, and it's it's hard enough. To bring electricity to an area, whether it's in America or Guatemala, but you know, of course, when people are shooting at you and and they're blowing up your hydro facilities like they did in Vietnam, um, but it, it's just I think I think what I learned was just the great hope for people. And 
you know, Guatemala, we went into a home and asked this lady, you know, what she was looking most forward to about having electricity. And, and she said to my daughter, she says, well, I, I, I don't know, but I've been just waiting for so long. And, and I think, you know, whether it was Vietnam or Guatemala, it's just sort of this hope about what electricity can do. And so I, I think no matter where you go, you find sort of that, that hope about what, what electricity can do to transform lives. Well, I really, I really appreciate that. And, and I hope that, uh, you know, people will not only look into maybe some of the, the stories there, but that they'll also take the time to, to read your book on Vietnam, uh, if, if, you know, this topic of electrification interests them and, and really, you know, both of your books, which uh, I guess leads me to my next question. Where can people find your books? You know, I think the best way, and I, you know, I'll inscribe it there. I have a website, tedcaseauthor.com, and that's one word. Um, you know, they are, you can find them, um, you know, you can find them on Amazon as well, but I think probably the best way is, is through my website again, tedcaseauthor.com. So thank you for the promotion there, Austin. I appreciate it. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, aside from the fact that I would, I would recommend people to go check them out, you know, it's also, uh, I feel like it, it would only be doing you justice to, uh, make sure that after we spend time talking about it today, that we actually give people the the uh, guidance on how to, you know, follow up and actually go read the books. So um, another question I, I have to ask, and, uh, you know, I hope I'm not putting you on the spot with it, but is there an audiobook version of these by chance? There is not an audio. No, not, not yet. But I think that's the that's certainly the trend. And so uh, that's a probably food for thought for me. Well, and <laughs> maybe today's podcast is some good practice on that. And uh, if you need access to any equipment, you can certainly let us know. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So, uh, well, I, I appreciate your time today. I, you know, we're we're winding down here, and, and we've really covered a lot of bases. But um, it sounds like you've listened to the podcast before, and you probably know where we're we're going to close out. Um, so, could you give the listeners of the podcast some some good advice to close out on today, whether it's about the the subjects we covered or or anything else? Just uh, uh, a nice piece of advice that you like to to live by or, or maybe something that stood out to you recently and uh, something that the people can take home and and uh, chew on here for the next two weeks before our next episode. Yeah, no, thank you. I, You know, one of the things I've been just thinking about lately is just sort of gratitude. And again, I think part of it came from the, my experience in Guatemala, but I just, this, you know, we talked today a lot about the hydro facilities and these incredible projects, you know, Grant Cooley and Bonneville and these others. But, you know, what makes this program so fascinating and just so worthwhile of being involved in is, is the people and, you know, public power in, in the Northwest and just the incredible people that we have in, involved in it. And, you know, again, I've been involved in this for 14 years at OECA, and but, you know, really my entire career has been sort of revolving around the Northwest and these, and these issues. And the, the people are what makes it worthwhile. And again, these are incredible projects, but these are um, what keeps me going is, is my membership and, you know, the people that I get to, to interact with. And that includes, you know, my friends at River Partners. So I, um, that's, that's been, been on my mind lately and just sort of the gratitude about is, you know, as I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not retiring soon, but I, there's certainly for me, there's more, you know, yesterdays and tomorrow. And I'm just so blessed with the, the people that I've come across in my career. And uh, so that, that's, that's on my mind lately. And I hope other people will reflect on that as well. Absolutely. And, and you know, there is, uh, I think maybe a little bit of gratitude to, to have for, you know, not just the, the work that, that folks like yourself are, are doing every day, but to think about the, the generations of, of people's livelihoods that have been dedicated to public power, to, to hydro, to getting us to where we are today and, and allowing us to be able to enjoy those benefits. And I also, I think it's, it's maybe the best opportunity to uh, remind everyone that the, the public power world is not 
indeed vicious as i think uh you described it in the in the recording that you brought up earlier it's it it's i don't think that there's much nicer people you can find on the planet and that at least if if nothing else you can be very grateful for that right <laughs> yeah i think that's a brilliant point absolutely richard nixon had it wrong completely he must he must have uh not not run across the right people i don't know well, perfect. Well, thank you very much for, for making the time today. I, I really appreciate it. And um, I, I look forward to, uh, I, I actually need to read up on your books now. So I look forward to, to doing that. And uh, I think I might move them to the, stop, the uh, top of the stack of my embarrassing books on my nightstand. So um, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get right on that. And I hope uh, the rest of our listeners do. And, and again, thank you for making the time today. I really appreciate it. I, I enjoy it immensely. Thank you, Austin, for the opportunity and, and keep up again. This is a your podcasts are are terrific. I, I learn a lot. And so, you know, keep doing them. Thank you. Thank you. And and one last thing I, I totally I, I spaced on it until just now. But, um, you know, beyond that, for, for people interested in ORECA, uh, where where should they go? How can they get involved? Um, you know, let's let's maybe close out there. So, well, we have um, we have a website, ORECA. Um, .org. But, you know, we also have our, our foundation is Oregon Empowers. If people are, are interested in that, this is our, our, our foundation to try to raise money for future projects that we're involved in. And so that's, um, I think, OregonPowers.org is our, our philanthropic um, website. That's the link for that. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Well, that's uh that's where we'll end it and uh everyone now has their their assignment so go get some reading in go get involved in uh in our rural electric uh co-ops and uh we'll talk to you in two weeks and and ted thanks again for coming on thank you today's episode of dam comes with a bit of homework your reading assignment is to go pick up a copy of power plays and pulls wires in war and thumb through the pages. I may be hosting a podcast, but I'm all for consuming physical media in this digital age. Simply put, it's good for you. And after today's podcast, I can at least speak for myself when I say that I've got an itch to do a deeper dive into the history that Ted laid out for us. Now, I'm also giving you a writing assignment, and don't worry, I'm going to be doing it too. Let's all give this 10 minutes of writing thing a shot and see how it goes. I'm not expecting anyone to write a book, but seriously, it can't hurt. If you're not sure what to write about, well, I've got some suggestions. You could always write to your elected officials at the local, state, and federal level to let them know just how much you love hydro and public power. Believe it or not, there's still a tremendous value to doing that, and the thousands of people who've signed up on our website and made their voices heard in various public processes have made a significant impact on policy outcomes. Is that too much for you? Hey, no worries. You could always just spend a couple of minutes writing up a review for this podcast telling us and the world how much you love it, if you love it. Positive ratings and reviews on your preferred listening platform are essential to helping us grow and expand our hydro-loving audience. And when you're done, make sure to hit the subscribe button and tap the bell icon to turn on notifications so you don't miss future episodes, which are set to release every other Friday. In the meantime, You can visit us at nwriverpartners.org and check us out on social media at nwriverpartners. I should also mention, we've got these really neat blogs that are currently on our LinkedIn page and soon to be coming to our website called Runoff. And the May edition is being published on the very same Friday as the release of the episode of Damn You Just Listened To. I think that's everything for now. So until next time, see ya!